Good morning, friends. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and joining me again is my friend David Zills, the apologist. How you been? I got to take an extended break over Christmas and holiday, so I actually am feeling ready for the new year. We'll see how long it lasts, but for now, I, I got to bounce back in my steps, so I'm thankful for that. That's a great feeling when you're actually like energized and ready to, to get a bath and get up after it again. And uh, yeah, so well, that's that's a good one. I'm glad that you're feeling rested. Um, we've been uh, we've been talking apologetics. Uh, it, we've been talking a lot of, of apologetics. Do we maybe just want to sort of like do a bird's eye view of everything we've covered so far before we dive into the next big one? I think that's really helpful because we we spent a lot of time in the weeds on a couple different topics, but I think going back to the bird's eye view is really helpful. And really, I think 2022, our discussion centered on collecting data. And 2023, we're going to start out by saying, how do we explain the data? So at a very simple level, those are kind of the two steps in how you make a case for Jesus, historically speaking. All right. So the two main pieces of collecting the data we looked at last semester really were gathering all the, his the first one was gathering all the historical sources. So we looked at the Bible, we said we're not going to include the Bible as assuming that it's inerrant and inspired, but we're also not going to exclude it. We're going to treat it like any other historical source and test it like any other historical source. And the testimony that withstands scrutiny, we can add to our collection of data that we use to test theories and hypotheses about who Jesus is. And then we looked at um, different sources outside the Bible too, and made the case that there's really nothing surprising outside the Bible. The, and there's the only thing that's surprising is we actually have a lot of information about Jesus outside the Bible, and it's all consistent with what's in the Bible. So that was the first part about looking at sources, identifying the first and second century sources that are relevant and testing them to see which ones do we think are credible. And some of them we said are probably not credible, in particular things like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas or these things that don't show signs of going back to any, any historical witnesses that were actually there. And then the second thing we did is we spent a lot of time on miracles. I was actually surprised that we did as many episodes as we did, but it seemed to be a topic that gathered a lot of interest. Yeah. And the reason we did that is because you can gather sources like we did, and then you can go straight to how do we explain this, but there's going to be in the back of everyone's mind, well... Some of these sources are claiming miracles, and some of these explanations that you're giving for the data are miraculous explanations, and I can't just believe that stuff without, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and that kind of thinking. So you have to address miracles when you're talking about Jesus, because no matter how you cut the early sources about Jesus, you find miracles. Yeah. And if you're going to take a Christian explanation for the facts about Jesus, there are going to be miraculous explanations like Jesus rose from the dead and things like that. And so we had to look at miracles and we spent a good time on that. And the, the main takeaway was if you look at philosophy and especially modern miracles and a lot of the things going on today, there's really no reason to be extra skeptical about Christian documents, the New Testament, Christian explanations for the data about Jesus. There's no reason for extra skepticism because the things, the miracles Jesus did in the Bible, a lot of them are still happening today. And so we don't have to therefore say, well, these sources are bad sources because they're like fairy tales. They're not fairy tales if these things are still happening. Um, so, so that's kind of where we've been. Now what we want to do is we say we've gathered this data and we've made the case that the Christian sources are not somehow disadvantaged because of miracles. Now what we want to do is we want to say, given all this historical data about Jesus, how do we explain it? And so there are two questions we want to focus on going into the new year. One is who was Jesus? And the other one is what happened to Jesus after he died? Yeah. And the, the case we're going to be making is not surprisingly that Jesus rose from the dead for the second question and that he is God for the first question. Um, but we're not going to be doing that by saying, well, the Bible's true, therefore, whatever the Bible says is true. We're going to be saying, let's look at historical data and use normal 
call it scientific reasoning to test hypotheses and see which ones actually fit the data and which ones don't fit the data. Hmm. All right. So, um, yeah, because this is this is even the scriptures themselves would recognize the question. Paul says, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, your faith is in vain. and You are above all to be pitied. So um, we're, even even Paul himself is, is willing to sort of confront these questions and say everything depends on this. So it's important that you check it out. Yeah, and that that passage is actually interesting. When I was at uh, starting out my undergrad, I was learning a lot about the philosophy of science as it comes to, uh, is there a place for God in science? And a lot of the thinkers I was reading said that you, the God hypothesis, as it's called, is not scientific. And there's a specific reason from the philosophy of science that they cited. I think it goes back to a man named Karl Popper. The philosophy of science is very interesting, a little bit dry, but if you like science, it's very interesting. It can help you become a better scientist. It did me. Yeah. But, um, but Karl Popper said... The hallmark of a good scientific theory is that it's falsifiable. So, mm. and so the this is something I learned actually in grad school. I was learning statistical methods for some scientific things I was doing for my kind of hard science PhD. And I was also doing a lot of apologetics reading kind of for my own benefit. And I what I realized is that the same method that scientists use for thinking about different theories on the basis of data, it's the same method that's used in forensics for thinking about a crime scene and different theories about who killed the dead person. It's the same kind of reasoning that's used in history, whether it's historical apologetics of Christianity or any history, when you say we need a historical theory about what happened and we want to test it with the historical data we have, underlying all these methods or all these fields, there's the same basic underlying method. And the idea is that a theory can only be falsified by data. It can't be proven by data. Mm -hmm. And so the God hypothesis, is it's claimed, is not falsifiable. You can always believe in God in spite of any amount of evidence, and so therefore you can't falsify it. So it might be true, but it's not a good scientific theory. Um, so the thing that you brought up with Paul is that he actually is putting out there a falsifiability criterion for Christianity. He said, if Jesus has not been raised, then Christianity is false, and we are to be pitied among all men because of everything we've lost for the sake of this, this claim. And so if we found bones in the Middle East that we could 100% or you can, I'm not going to say 100% because you can never 100%, but let's say 99% we had confidence that these were the bones of Jesus. Well, that would falsify the New Testament claim that Jesus was bodily resurrected. And so while an abstract God hypothesis may not be a good scientific theory, the Christian hypothesis actually is because it's falsifiable. When we did our Christmas episode right before the break, we talked a lot about how Christmas is actually really relevant to people who have doubt and skeptical questions because in it, in, in this the Christmas narrative, God puts himself into history in a way that can be tested. And so rather than just being this abstract God in the ether, he kind of becomes God under the microscope, so to speak. And we can test the theories to see if they stand up to scrutiny. That's uh, so important um, because you're you're right. You can just sort of say, well, I believe in the flying spaghetti monster and well, nothing you can ever change my mind, say can change my mind. And I, I've met people who do that with Jesus too, that, you know, he he's real in my heart. And, and if they found his bones, he would still be real in my heart. And Paul himself is, is warning us that's a bad road. Yeah, sometimes scholars will call this the Christ of faith versus the Jesus of history. The mm. Jesus of history is the man who lived 2,000 years ago that we can test with historical methods. The Christ of faith is the Christ in my heart that I believe in. And there are some people, and there have been different influences and thinkers who have tried to separate those two and say, no matter what you find about the Jesus of history, the Christ of faith is always secure because it depends on something other than history. But if you look at how 
Christians historically, ever since it be ever since Christianity began, if you look at how they talked about it, they never talked like this. I mean, go back to Paul. He says, if this is not a historical fact, then there is no Christ of faith because the Christ of faith is the Jesus of history. Right. So how do we start asking those questions then to, to figure out, well, it is, uh, is, is Jesus God and what happened to him after he died? Who is Jesus and what happened after he died? Yeah. So, yeah, I think let's talk about method um, because when we look at these two questions, we're going to use the same method. And so okay. becoming aware of the thought process in advance will help us to recognize the pattern when we start applying it case after case after case. Um, and so it's the same tool that we're going to use over and over again. And the tool is how do you test hypotheses with data? And so it's used in science. It's used in the science of forensics. It's used, you know, in crime scenes to condemn people to a lifetime in prison. So, you know, if we can do this with crime scenes, let's do it with our faith. In fact, Jay Warner Wallace, a former atheist cold case detective, realized that he could use his cold case reasoning with the gospels to make inferences about Jesus and in the process became a Christian. And now he's a famous Christian apologist who has lots of interesting things to say. Um, his ministry is called cold case Christianity. So, and he wrote a book called that, but um, we can use it for history too. Um, in a sense, criminology is just a field of history because a crime is a historical event. Um, so the, the idea is this is how it works. First, you start out with all the possible explanations for the data that you have. Maybe it's a body, maybe it's a document in the case of Jesus or a set of documents. You start out with all the possible theories and then you go through your data and you take your first piece of data and you say, okay, is this data consistent with this theory? Yes, okay, so this theory is still on the table. What about this theory? oh, actually, no, this data contradicts this theory. So we can throw that Makes theory sense. out. And we do this one by one with all the data we have. And at the end, through process of elimination, we're going to have one, two, maybe five theories left. Ideally, we'd only have one because then we would kind of know the answer as to what happened. But sometimes you might not have enough data to, um, to eliminate everything but one. And so let's for a concrete example, let's look at like a crime scene or let's say a, a death scene. We won't call it a crime. So let's say you find a body dead on the floor. There's blood and you call the cops and they say the first thing is, is this a crime scene? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what are all the possible causes of death? Those are all your theories that are on the table at the beginning. So it could be natural due to illness, list all the illnesses. Those are all possible theories. It could be a suicide. It could be a homicide, list all your suspects and methods of killing and motives and all that. These are all, you know, you could add more. These are all your theories. So now let's look at the data and see if the data can eliminate any of the theories. Okay, so there's the man was stabbed through the heart. It's obvious by looking at the crime scene, the knife is right there and there's a knife wound through his heart. Okay, this probably isn't a heart attack. It's probably not dying of, you know, some natural cause of illness. So we've eliminated a huge bunch of theories because we found data that contradicts it. Okay, now we can say, is it a suicide or a homicide? Well, the worst knife wounds are through the back. So this isn't something you would expect if it was a suicide. It was really dark for me to laugh at. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, illustrating a methodology. This is actually something Jay Warner Wallace does in his Cold Case Christianity yeah. book to illustrate his method. He does a crime scene because it's what he's used to. So stabbed in the back, probably not, you know, unless the person was committing suicide in a really weird way to, the, to frame someone. I mean you know, which you'd have to consider as a possibility, but probably not a suicide. Okay, what about a homicide? Okay, well, form the list of suspects in the usual way, go through, did they have a motive? Did they have opportunity and so forth? And you wanna go one by one until you can say, one suspect has motive, opportunity, all the things a suspect needs to be convicted and none of the other ones does. And then you can take your case to court. So that's how it works in forensics criminology. With the case of Jesus, you can actually do the same thing. So who was Jesus? Let's say we're, that's the question we're trying to answer. And let's say one of the theories on the table is the Christian theory that Jesus is God. 
okay, is there data that we could find that would falsify or contradict that theory? Well, if we found a letter written by Jesus to his apostle John right before he was crucified saying, by the way, John, I don't know why people are talking about me being God. It's not true. It was never true. Don't ever worship me. Okay, well, that that would that would if Jesus was God, he probably wouldn't write that kind of letter. So that would falsify it. What about was Jesus a con artist? Yeah. You know, maybe, you know, we've had a lot of people start religions for their own benefit, maybe for sex, money, power, all these things. Think of Jonestown, the tragedy where we get the phrase drink the Kool-Aid, where a bunch of people committed mass suicide by drinking Kool-Aid with poison because their leader said it was what they were supposed to do. You know, maybe Jesus is some horrible con artist. Well, we can approach that a number of different ways, but I think one data point that we have that falsifies this idea of Jesus being a con artist is what happened to Jesus in his trial before the Jewish council. The Jews for a long time had been trying to kill Jesus. It's no secret that that's what they want. They're looking for testimony to put him to death. And by Jewish law, you need two witnesses to agree, and they can't even get that. And so finally, the high priest is just getting impatient. He knows that they're on a deadline because the Passover is coming up. They're doing this at night because they want to do it in secret so there's not a revolt. So to take so to take matters into his own hands, he asked Jesus, so just, just tell us, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed, which Matthew has it recorded as, which is kind of a Hebrew way of saying the son of God in a polite way, because you don't want to say the name of God be, out of respect. And so Jesus says, I am. Uh, in other gospels, he's recorded as saying, you have said so, which is kind of a Hebrew um, way of deferring or a Greek way of whatever the original language was that he said it in was, it was a way of deferring responsibility back to the person asking the question. But lest we have any ambiguity what Jesus means, he follows up and he makes a strong statement connecting two Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and combines them in a way no one had thought to combine him in a way that says, I fulfill both of these in a way that shows I am God and I am actually going to judge you at the end of time. Mm. So Jesus knows this is something that they can use to punish him by death, and he knows that's what they want to do, and he still does it. So he might be a very good artist and actor because he's very committed to his character, and he's not breaking character even when it, his life is on the line. But as terrible a con, con artist, yeah. <laughs> as a con artist, he's terrible because the whole point of a con is you fool people for your own benefit. As soon as your life is at stake, the con is up, the jig is mm -hmm. up. Yeah, you, you so, make a different play at something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you go to the Greeks and you try to be one of their gods or something. Um, but that's not what Jesus does. He goes to his death for this claim. So that's not that that seems to rule out the con artist theory. And so you, we could list examples, but we'll go into this one by one for the claims. Who is Jesus and what happened to him after his death? And we'll make the case that the only two theories that don't contradict the data that the only two theories that fit all the data we have are the idea that Jesus is God and he rose from the dead. That's, that's a great goal. Let's do it. Okay. Sounds good. Looking forward to it, David. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll talk to you next time and uh, dive in deeper. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Harrison. Have a good one. You too.